still so dancing. Catchy. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Not much. It's been a while since I've been in the show, that's for sure. So it's been a while since we've had Matthew here. And we got DJ Anderson down here as well. I'm sorry, I'm still moving around stuff on my screen here. Uh, with, welcome to the Needle Bar. Today we're going to be talking all things lettering. Uh, we were uh, referring to this a little bit when we were a couple shows back and got a little bit into discussion lettering and different issues and usages and stuff like that. Um, that we might discuss it a little bit more. Well, I love the topic because for me, lettering is like probably the most important thing that we do um, that can make or break a logo. Because I feel like the biggest challenges that we have come with the lettering because it's usually small. Like exactly you know, getting the quarter inch and all of that. That can your logo can be as good as possible, but if the lettering doesn't look good, mm -hmm. none of it looks good. So. Yeah, because typically your eye is going to go to any text and a design first. And a lot of times, you know, unless designs are really, really symmetrical and really, really, I guess, recognizable, sometimes that is uh, that's something that attracts your eye. And if something's off, it, it can you know, be visible, but most of the time people are going to start reading the design first. And if the lettering is shaky or, or unreadable or anything like that, then yeah, it starts, starts de degrading the look of your design. <clears throat> yep. But really quick, before we dive into <laughs> this, let's get a, take a couple comments. We got Matthew watching from Ohama. <laughs> oh, I got Omaha, it. Nebraska. Wow, me too. We got Sydney King from Odessa, Texas. Hopefully you're staying cool in Texas. Kingsbury Craft from uh, Bremerton, Washington. Bremerton. Nice. Let's see, we got a little back and forth. I think everybody's just kind of chit-chatting. My home state of Washington. Oh, yeah? Where about are you from? Well, I was on the um, east side, so I was on the desert side. Not not pretty like Bremerton. No. <laughs> but yeah, um, getting back to things as far as, yeah, text, text is definitely a tricky thing. Um, there's so many different factors involved when it comes to text. I think, you know, the, the garment type, the garment color, uh, the garment fabric, um, you know, looking and looking at, at your garment types and, and, and the different factors there. Um, the size of your text, the fonts of your text, all, all these things that you have so many factors, you know, going in all at once. It's, it's kind of that fine tuning to make sure that, that you get the settings, right. The, the correct fonts, the correct colors and everything that's going to work with your particular project. And that's, that's where I think the most difficult thing is dialing in those, those all those elements all at once to kind of get that nice clean clean look on your lettering. I am going to there's a couple of posts that I saw recently uh, that I just took screenshots of. You know, I I digitize a font every single month and um, you know for my master class group and it is, um, you learn a lot about lettering and limitations and best practices. And I'm amazed at what we find out there, like fonts that are for sale. Exactly. And that's where, that's where a lot of it is hard. Um, because especially with, with people that aren't too familiar with the software or are new to the industry or new to a software. You know, they, you know, some, something like a, a, an art program or, or Adobe, like Adobe Illustrator, for instance, you pay for a subscription to Adobe Illustrator and there's a lot of assets that come with it or assets that you can add and a lot of them are fonts and, and clip art and stuff like that. And, you know, it's overwhelming how much, 
how much they're offering. Um, embroidery programs are, are kind of no different depending on what and program you're working with. They usually come to the stuff that's got the stock fonts. Um, the number of fonts really depends on either the, the software itself or the level that you have. Uh, and to the experience, the quality of the fonts is the not to throw any particular software under the bus, but I've seen, you know, people post pictures of like, oh, why is my lettering like this? And, and they, they explain this is the stock font from X, you know, software. And a lot of times it's, they, they see the package of the software and they see, oh, this comes with 75 fonts. And it's just assumed that all these fonts, all these fonts are going to work. Yeah, so I have I have like a pet peeve with keyboard lettering. And my biggest pet peeve with keyboard lettering is that when fonts are digitized, they're digitized at one size. Okay. If the digitizer added push and pull compensation manually, it only works best at that one size. Right. Right. So if you take a font that started out as th like half an inch and you make it two inches, your push and pull compensations way off. Right. And my bit, that's my biggest pet peeve with text and lettering is if everything doesn't line up perfectly along the baseline and at the top where, you know, like, so in the example you see on the screen, the a, the H and the Y, are much taller than the Z, the C, and the R. And the only reason that that's happening is because the Z, the C, and the R, is those stitches are going vertically, whereas the A, H, and Y are going horizontally. So they're growing in height while the Z, C, and R are shrinking. Exactly. And it's like you have to understand that the push and the pull compensation is going to have to be adjusted some when right. you're using keyboard lettering if you want it to look good unless you're using it at the default size correct and 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 it'll take some practice too to see what what works at the default size without having to to do any editing or adjusting to the fonts that you have on your system um but yeah it, the, very well this this lettering looks a little bit bigger it might be like maybe a half inch or a little bit bigger um but who knows if this 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 particular font was done at six millimeters tall or something like that. The push and pull, you know, exponentially shrinks as you do the size of the lettering smaller. And if the original digitizing size and that push and pull compensation was made at that size that it was digitized, then yeah, those those settings or those compensations that were used are gonna are gonna work. But yeah, as as you blow up and as the kind of the the compensation that you need in the push and the pull of, of the satins that you're using, um, it, it really does affect stock lettering. And as you go up in, in different fabrics and you start adding more densities and more underlays, that's going to have a factor too. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I'm going to hijack the, uh, the live stream video right now. Okay. Um, so I got this patch designed here. It's going to look kind of unproportional, but don't worry about that. But this is a stock font in Wilcom, and it is the block. Uh, this is small block one. Mm. So it's not meant for anything this size because this is uh, currently about one and a half inches tall. If I embroider that out, it's not going to look good. Yes, it's a stock font from Wilcom. But that's where you'd have to use a different font or something. Like this one looks completely different. They're both stock fonts. It's just uh, like DJ said earlier that there is a specific standard that they design it for. Wilcom has a reference manual of these are all the fonts we have. This is the size that we recommend, different sizes and underlays and stuff. I don't remember where that PDF is, but it's out there. And yeah, and more than likely, if your if your software is going to give you that information, it's it's there for a reason that you should kind of say, all right, this particular font's made and should be used at you know this size range or this size. Um, but 
correct me if I'm wrong, DJ, you, you do a lot of work with the software companies. I would think that fonts are going to mainly be done somewhere in like the name or left chest type size lettering in mind, because that's the majority of the time you're going to be using um, fonts. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Um, basically, like um, when you digitize a font, um, a lot of times you're digitizing at the smallest size that it can actually be, right? And that's based off of the width of the column. So, and then everything kind of grows from there. But the, the, the important thing is, even though they give you recommended range, that's based off of the width of the column. It doesn't, it's not based off compensation, right? So some fonts can go from a quarter inch to three inch but like matt showed like in that one example it was a small font and he did it big I, how big how much of a gap was there in millimeters in the top matt do you did you measure that um, it is oh that's inches hold on one second it is about two and three quarter millimeters 2.7 so it's like quite a bit and if that font would, would still work, you would just have to adjust it. But the, when I teach it um, and I teach fonts and resizing fonts, I created like a, just some artwork lines that are like six millimeters apart. And so whenever I resize lettering, I just bring that file in every time and I just line up the letters and I just resize them individually. Um, I don't know if I can show my screen. I could show you kind of how I do it, but um, it's just like a little quick guide that I use before I finish a design so that I know everything's going to line up exactly. And so if you showed that example, the Zachary one again, I would make sure that that the Z lined up with my top lines because it's going to pull down. And then the other letters, like the Y, the, I don't remember, was it Y, H, and the A, would they would go on the line that's six, like six millimeters less than the Z, right? So, right. I just line it all up and it makes sure that everything is perfect every time. And it's that's why, yeah, that's why when, when you're getting files, if you don't do your own digitizing, if you're getting files back from your digitizer, the lettering should look like it's going all over the place. It's, you know, letters are bigger than and, and shorter and, and, and wonky everywhere. And so it should look like that when it's coming from an image of either a people. But, um, yeah, I think that that's like one of the tricks of keyboard lettering. So, um, if, if you, it's my, it's my biggest pet peeve when I see designs, like people post images of any kind of a design. First thing I look at is lettering. And when one letter is taller than the other, it just drives me crazy. So it is, it's one of those things that I kind of have to make sure is, is right in a design. Um, and that's a good example right there um, that Matt put up. I think Matt did. Did you put yeah, that up? Yeah, this is mine. I think Justin lost his internet. So but what's this, the distance between your lines there? Uh, so this is, a, I cheated. This is a um, this is the same font that I had in the previous patch. I just did it because it's super exaggerated. Um, <laughs> so this is not, there's no science behind this. This is purely using it because it's bad. Uh, but, yeah, so, basically but what I would say with that is um, those two lines right there at the top, I would make them six millimeters apart. And the the Z, because they, those stitches are going vertically on the top and the bottom, they're going to hit the top line. 
the A at the bottom and the top are going to um, kind of hit the bottom line because they're going to grow in height. The Z is going to shrink in height, right? So they're going to meet in the middle. And so that's why I'll create the six millimeters apart. Now, there is one thing that I will do, and that's with the letter C or the letter O. Anything that gets curved up at the top, I'll expand that a little bit higher than mm -hmm. that top line because in your mind, when you look at it, even though if you did it exact on that top line, it's going to look smaller, but it's not necessarily it just looks smaller so you would actually exaggerate it up a little bit above the line like the top top of the r you know maybe a little bit but the o's the c's um those are the ones that like really play with your eyes right yeah so, there's there's a lot of push and pull compensation that that goes on with the but this is the easiest way letters. if if you create lines at the top and the bottom like up at the upper level and they're six millimeters apart if they're if the stitches are going vertically hit the top line if they're going horizontally make it hit the bottom line or the inner line and it's going to make sure that your lettering comes out looking at the right height right yeah exactly so um when it comes to stock fonts um there's a lot of times where like the the guy that uh matt had pulled up sh showing what kind of size they're going for um a lot of times that there's there's elements to the to the font that may may or may not work at different sizes as well um like serif fonts uh, hold on let me pull up here. I'm also one of those people that um, tends to not use keyboard fonts. Even if I have one that works, I like to hand digitize them, mm -hmm. um, manually digitize them, because I don't go left, right, right, left, center. Like, I'll do center out like on hats, but it all is in accordance with the design. So I might right. go right to left instead of left to right. And so I like to manually digitize letters. I'm going to hijack the screen there again. Um, for instance, like uh, serif fonts, like this one here at the bottom, you can see that it uses the, the serifs as basically just wide satins that, uh, that they don't have serifs that are perpendicular like this one. So, you know, taking a font like this, this is something you'd want to use in smaller fonts that are going to utilize just kind of widening the the tips of the of the satins to make those serifs next to you know something like this where if you are doing a larger font having those serifs the actual a perpendicular element to this lettering is going to work far far better because if you were to wanted to take this font and use it really large as you can see it's going to make these stitches way too wide where it comes out to the to the widest point and it's going to want to start either skipping stitches triggering the the uh, trim sensors or or trim codes and or start put, splitting stitches depending on what settings mm -hmm. you have so yeah the, the font's going to definitely you know kind of dictate what you can do as far as stock fonts at what sizes that you're doing as well um so that's something else you need to look at yeah no, I'm glad you showed that one because that is like certain fonts like that one specifically where it goes from side to side only on the I and the M at the top, the capped corners or um, not capped corners, but the the serif. Um, no, I'm talking about the stitch. I don't know why my mind went blank, but, you know, going all the way across um, and the software having to split it. Sometimes that's a cool effect, but not in a case like this, because it's a very small part of exactly. the split. So you want to avoid that. Yeah, because it's going to look weird where, you know, this is a solid satin going throughout the, the lettering and just at the very tip where it exceeds 13 
millimeters wide at this being, you know, a little over an inch tall, it's going to, it's going to create those, those weird splits just in those serifs. So your serifs going to look really weird compared to the, the solid letter. So yeah, you would, you know, look for a font that if you are going larger in size, that has something where the font, the, the serifs are its own element. So, you know, as it, as it grows, they're going to grow exponentially with the rest of the sentence. So. And I think it's important to point out is it's like some people might wonder, well, why did they do it that way? Right? Like, why do you give them two different options? Well, the one on the bottom can go a lot smaller in size than the one that's above it. Right. Uh, yeah. So using this one at six millimeters tall, you're going to come down and you're going to see these are really, really, really thin uh, serifs and those are going to be under a millimeter wide. So you're going to have a lot of issues with those really, really thin satins using that type of font. Um, another thing, too, is as you increase the size of the fonts, and again, depending on the font, because there's there's definitely fonts, to, you know, even if you're doing at a really large size, uh, a really, really thin font may still have, you know, satin widths that are only a millimeter or two wide. Um, but depending on on how wide your satins go, um, how big the fonts are and whatnot, you're going to start looking into different underlays, different densities. Um, kind of the rule of thumb is as you get bigger in size, size and the satins start growing, you're going to have more underlay, more density. Um, the underlay is going to kind of really be dictated by the, the type of garment it is. Um, but the wider and the bigger those satins go, you're, you're really going to want to build that foundation. Otherwise, you know, seeing in, in between those stitches and, and being able to kind of run your finger down that satin, if you don't have enough density, it's, it's really going to show through as far as the, the garment showing through, especially in those contrasting colors, you know, white on black, black on white, something like that. So that's kind of a, a loose rule of thumb. Bigger the elements more density, more underlay. Um, the underlay that problem that I've seen on small text, I see a lot of the time the answer in all these groups is remove the underlay altogether. And I think just a general rule like that, just to answer the question, I think it's, it's a really bad idea. Underlays, it's needed. It's a foundation for your for your stitches to be, you know, raised off the garment. Um, a lot of times, it's just a matter of adjusting the, the underlay. You know, <clears throat> as people learn their software and learn, you know, what works and not works at certain sizes, they, I think they they pick up these keywords. You know, like. Center, center line underlay, run underlay, whatever your software calls it, where it's basically just using a single stitch down the center of your satin. Um, that's going to probably be your best bet when you're working with smaller lettering. Because um, what that's going to do, it's, it's, it's not going to be hammering so many stitches, not wide stitches like zigzags, not um, edge walks where it's really, really close to that edge that you start having your underlay protruding out from underneath your satin stitches. So you know, a lot of times they say, oh, I heard center line underlay, center walk, whatever it's called. They apply that to five millimeter, four millimeter text, and they still start, you know, showing pictures. I got these stitches sticking out everywhere, what's going on. And it may just be a matter of changing the stitch length of their, of their underlay. Um, yeah, that's the thing that I like to teach a lot, especially with small lettering. Is anytime you see a little loop on the outside of your lettering, and you've probably all seen it before, that's your underlay popping out. Exactly. Which means your stitch length is too long. So if you shorten that stitch length of that center line, it won't ever pop out the side. Right. So I'm going to really loosen up this density just so you can kind of see the underlay stitches. But right in here, uh, this I have edge run underlay set on this lettering. So right in here, the edge run is where it actually hugs the edge of the of the satin stitch. So on small lettering, if you can imagine that this this is only a millimeter wide and this is trying to hug just the outside of it. 
uh, I would say 99% of the time, you're going to have all of this underlay protruding out. The, the top stitches are not going to be wide enough and substantial enough that it's going to cover all that underlay. But even switching this to a center run underlay, as you can see, that underlay is running right down the center of those. Um, if that stitch length, I don't know if you can pick up on the video, the, the white dots. These white dots are your actual your, your needle penetration. So say like you have the underlay stitch length at five millimeters and not varying length. If you have those, those needle penetrations quite a bit wider to each other, um, there is going to be that kind of that loop in between there. And then that loop's kind of loose. It comes back and tries to do the, the top stitch over it. And again, working with smaller lettering, you know, you only have that certain width of that smaller lettering that if that loop falls either left or right, it's going to start sticking out outside of that, that satin stitch. So a lot of times it's not just the type of, of underlay, but the settings of the underlay, the variable length is something where as it turns a corner does it kind of stutter step around the corner to make sure that it does short stitches um, is the stitch length long, uh, short enough that you know you're not jamming a bunch of needle penetrations in there that you don't need to where the short a st a stitch length is so small but you want to have that that stitch length that's going to work and make sure that those stitches stay underneath those top stitches I wanted to bring up a couple things too, going through the comments while uh, we're at. Uh, Mike asked a question about uh, when you hit a point of diminishing returns, like, is it ever worth, like, worthwhile to go into all this work? Um, I reached out to him specifically because this was a while ago, just to make sure exactly what this is. Um, he's referring to when you adjust the, um, like, how the, the, this, your 0.6 millimeter thing where you make a like an a shorter because it'll expand out like when would you not do that because the lettering is so small like is there ever a time it's just like just um not, i mean if you look at small lettering like lettering that's like a quarter of an inch it looks way more exaggerated than like a larger one right so the small lettering it should still have a difference of about 0.4 millimeters right because one's still going to grow about 0.2 shrink about 0.2 and so you still have to have that push and that pull even on the really small lettering yeah because you got to remember the, the the width of that thread if it's if it's just yeah. pushing that much more and especially on really contrasting colors seeing that one extra thread on top of the a next to the top of the z and it just pushes that much more up it's 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 gonna it's really gonna diminish the the look of the lettering yeah i don't know about Wilcom because i don't use it but one of the nice things about like a pulse is that you can adjust push compensation based on a percentage or by lines so a lot of times if i'm doing small lettering i just say adjust it by one line so it just eliminates one row of stitches on each side and that usually kind of covers it and the reason it doesn't put the only reason it doesn't push as much is because you usually use lighter density mm -hmm. on really small letters which and that was that was going to be my next segue in was yeah it plays a yeah. role in push especially yeah so so and actually um that's where you're, you're kind of that idea of that general rule of less density, less underlay for smaller letterings, more density, more underlay for, for bigger uh, text or lettering. Um, yeah, it's because the idea is you're, you're really not trying to jam that many stitches um, into that small area because it, it just starts creating quite a bit of, of problems. Um, you know, the, the, the small openings of letters like the middles of A's and in uh, lowercase e's and a's and o's and whatnot um hammering that that the amount of stitches in that little area is either going to a cause holes in the garment or b it's just going to close up um, just because you're working such a small area so there's that finesse that you really want to use um 
a lighter density to kind of just, you're kind of shaping that letter. Um, and again, when it comes to lettering, I know the there used to be the, the three foot rule um, as far as, you know, only include lettering in your designs if you can read it from three feet away. Um, the joke is now six feet and, and yeah. Um, Makes it easier for us. So. Yeah, so a lot of times, you know, if, if you're inspecting that lettering and, and you know, you're using a lighter density and, and, and which is compensating for all those issues that you're having with lettering, it does come out cleaner when you are using less density. Uh, up close and personal, it may not be the, the, the best looking lettering, but, you know, from three to six feet away, it is going to look cleaner and it's going to look more legible um, when it comes to the smaller lettering. What so, size lettering is that there? Uh, so this is like 1.3 or 1.5 millimeter tall. Wow. It is 0. 0.6 um, spacing and there is no underlay in it because I made my fill behind it be the, the angle that most of the underlay would need to be for a center run. So I didn't need to put any of that in. Now, granted, when you get off to the side, it gets a little worse, but you're going to be focusing more on the straight ups. Like that S looks a little funky because there is no true like left, right, center underline or underlay, mm -hmm. but everything else is fine. And same with up here. It's like you can see all the stitch angles are running straight vertical. So anything that is running vertical like that eye looks a little weird. That's because it's crossing over into different threads. But I mean, you're looking at something super tiny. Like if I can find where my finger is, you can see it's tiny. So pull that away a little bit and, and show the overall. Yeah. So up close, you can start seeing those perfections and stuff, but you know, it's digitized in a way where you loosen up the density enough where it's not going to be just a big ball of thread and he's not going to have a bunch of bird's nests and, you know, big old knots in the back of his patch. Um, but the lettering is there. It, 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 it serves its purpose. It's, it's legible. Um, so a lot of times, you know, again, there's the, there's that toss up of, what you exclude out of a design because you know there's a lot of small lettering um but sometimes you know corporate rules or or collegiate rules of of what has to be included in a design and you just try to do the best you can as far as that balance of just trying to trying to make it as, as legible as possible recognizable as possible but up close and personal a lot of times embroidery is not the, the prettiest thing um but from far away it can look quite good uh, with the adjustments that you make. <laughs> right. um, so the next thing, uh, so we just talked about density. Um, did we talk about needles and like use of different needles, Ramona's comment? Oh, no. Uh, so really quickly, I have from 65, nine to 70, 10, 75, 11, 80, 12 needles up in my cabinet. I only use 7511, but I can get away with doing, I mean, this text that you just saw, I mean, this is the whole patch. That was everything on here is 40 weight embroidery thread. There's no 60 weight or no weird uh, trickery with you use a, was it a 65.9 typically for 60 weight thread because it's a smaller needle. I don't have to do any of that because I just used a um, less dense stitch spacing. Um, so I can kind of get away with that. So the, th the thing about the 60 weight, and there's, there's the big debate. Again, a lot of times you see in these, these groups uh, with questions of small lettering not coming out clean, a lot of people do throw out the idea of 60 weight thread, 65 needles. A um, couple of things you gotta, you gotta think about that. Uh, if you have a multi-head machine, are you gonna wanna switch out that many needles and, and thread? Uh, a lot of people keep maybe you know, multi-head machine, multi-needle machines, they may keep head, you know, needle one and two is always 60 weight black and white and always 65 needles on those two needles. Um, so there's that factor. Um, kind of opposite of what Matt did to compensate for that 40 weight thread, he lessened the density. You actually want to work the other direction when you're working with a thinner thread. 
you're gonna yeah, have to add de- 20 percent or something yeah you're gonna want to add density because now that thread is is uh is thinner um typically you need to add a little bit of pull compensation um because just overall that thread's going to react differently to the run-of-the-mill settings that you're used to as far as stock lettering digitizing or whatever it may be so personally i don't see that much difference in knowing the settings to use like like matt did at, at a certain sub five millimeter lettering um kind of knowing the settings that work with 40 weight thread has a very similar uh result at 60 weight and you don't have to change the way you're digitizing or change the settings that you're using for that particular lettering. Uh, I need um, to issue a correction quick. Uh, I believe when I was showing you the text, I said it was like a one point something millimeter tall. No, yeah, it's actually three. three. I don't yeah. know where I came up with that. That was way too small. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, that was, that was pretty impressive, Matt. But one of the things that you'll find, um, the reason why you use 65 nine a lot of times with the 60 weight thread is because the hole that the needle makes is much smaller right so when you use a 75 11 with 60 weight thread depending on the fabric it can be choppy along the edges because it's creating a bigger hole in the fabric and so it allows you to kind of see stabilizer through it a little bit so it's just one thing to keep in mind depending on the fabric is like if you're going to use 60 weight i always had needle one and two was always the um my 65 nine needles with 60 weight thread but you can't always do that um i like doing like what matt did as well like if you if you can learn how to make 40 weight thread work with small lettering it's just you know you don't have to change it out and it for production that's just a a better way of doing it Um, but i just wanted to point that out with the needle size if you do use 60 weight it can make a difference in how it looks a little bit yeah so the Let me get back to my screen here. I think the biggest benefit, um, if you are doing, let's see here. And just to uh, answer Cindy's question real quick, can you ever run 60 weight with the 7511? Yes, you can. Uh, sometimes I'll do that just because I'm too lazy to switch it. You just got to remember that your needle is going to be making a bigger hole than what your thread. It's going to be a, a much bigger difference. So that's what uh, DJ was saying, but you might get stabilizer to show through. So you have to be and careful with that. You're, you can cut a hole in your fabric easier because you have to increase the density of 60 weight thread at the same time usually right so your your needle penetrations are going to be closer and the needles bigger right like so those things don't help you out right and that's that's exactly where i was kind of showing like when you're doing lowercase letters um these areas in here are going to be kind of your problem areas when you're working with those those sub uh five millimeter text um the actual voids uh, are, are a lot of times where the problem is. You're either gonna, you have a real buildup of the thread on the inside of those and you just kind of pushes together or you're gonna actually start ripping your, your uh, fabric or your garment. Um, there are things that you can kind of do when it comes to smaller lettering, um, especially if you have the capability within your software to edit the, uh, the text or if you're digitizing manually, uh, a lot of the times the rule of thumb is just kind of mm-hmm. like on an A, you kind of drop that that crossbar here and it opens up this, this void in the A. And you got to remember it kind of looks weird where it kind of almost is like a triangle, but you are going to have that push out on those satins. So yeah, in essence, when it, pull, pull 
pull up in the middle and push out on the bottom. So right. So that's gonna actually so closer to that, not about this, because yeah, these are gonna pull in towards the center and these are gonna push out. Um, another thing that I also do, you know, knowing that smaller lettering, if you know, if I do get a file that I'm editing or I'm using a stock font for for any reason, you can kind of go in a lot of times fonts are digitized to exactly the way that particular font they're using. So you gotta have these areas where you know, like a, a curved letter, like an E is going to stop here because, you know, it's it just happens to be that type of font where there it kind of curves back up. Mm -hmm. This area is going to close in, so it's going to actually sew almost like it's going to be an O with a line through it. So it may change the look of the font slightly just to kind of open it up and have have the, the E pointing out that way instead of up towards the letter. Uh, but you're going to have a lot more space in here after it sews, and it's going to sew a lot cleaner. Um, another trick that I do a lot when I am using really, really small lettering, like, you know, similar to what, what Matt had on his, on his patches to kind of combat these areas that may fill in. Um, if there are any areas that are within the, the letter, like say the A and the E, I'll actually use just a running stitch or a manual stitch to create that part of the letter. And it, it may not be, you know, exactly the same width as the other elements. But again, when you're getting that small and, and the you're working with barely a millimeter wide as far as that, that satin goes, the rest of the letter, that thickness of the thread of, of that running stitch is going to be quite similar to, to the thickness of those satins. So... Uh, those are little tricks that kind of open up those void areas to kind of not have satins all the way around it and filling in or, or ripping your garment. Yeah. And if you're wondering just how much space you need, like if you're looking at the letter E, if you have um, lettering that's closing up on you, but you're not, you, it's hard to remember exactly at what size they, they close up on you. Just measure it and it needs to have at least 0.8 millimeters. Anything less than 0.8 millimeters, like if you look at the inner part of the E, anything less than that is going to just be a ball of, it's just going to be, you know, just thread. You're not going to see an opening. Right. So, so for instance, I just, I just made this four millimeters tall as far as the E. I'm measuring this inside here. That's still at one millimeter wide between those elements. So that 0.97. But you're going to barely see fabric, but you're going to see a little bit of fabric. Right. But if it's less than like a 0.8, it's going to close up. Yeah. And possibly depending on the, the weight of the fabric or the tech fabric itself, it possibly could start ripping holes in the fabric as well. So, yeah. Um, I, yeah. It, it, when you, when you're there, there, again, there are some, fonts that come with certain softwares that they call them micro fonts and they actually have uh they are digitized in in some of these fashions where um the smaller elements like crossbars and whatnot are digitized with either manual or running stitches that work well say sub five millimeters or somewhere around four millimeters because um, they're keeping in mind those issues that we're talking about when they are digitizing those uh, I know when I first started using Wilcom many, many years, years ago, they didn't have any fonts like that that were like sub five millimeter that worked well. Um, but I know Pulse has a couple of them that there is a, a lot of uh, fonts that are almost all running stitch and, and they may have like like a lot of wispy script type fonts that they may have a portion of it is, as a small satin. Um, but a lot of it is just running stitches. So again, it is something where you can use, where you can have those small text. If it is something you have to have, um, it may not be the most legible thing in the world, but it is going to be recognizable and hopefully readable that you can kind of figure it out. Um, something that Cindy did bring up, and I know we were, we were working on a design <clears throat> that she was needing help with, um, embroidery machines so differently. Um, she, you know, she was having a, a problem with the design that I was helping her with, and she was saying that Baradin's running it great, my ZSK is not. 
So yeah, that, that definitely has a, a different factor on um, year of the design or the year of the machines, type of machines, type of thread. Um, there's so many different factors when it comes to, to embroidery in, in itself that lettering you're sometimes fighting against your, yourself. Um, the type of garments, the dreaded Richardson 112, small lettering right there at the bottom seam. You're could pull your hair out having 200 hats to run with, you know, five millimeter text that are sitting right in the middle of that scene. Uh, I've, I've seen it, I've done it, it's not fun. Um, so yeah, there's there's adjustments that you, you should probably wanna do if you know that you're working with that top of hat and lettering, you know, see if you can space it in a way where it kind of hovers that that seam and kind of goes either, either side of it. Sometimes you can fidge the actual center point of a word and, and if it's a little bit over one side or another and it kind of avoids that seam and but to the eye it doesn't look off center you know that's sometimes a trick you can use as far as lettering itself i mean you yeah. definitely don't want to take something and move it so far over that it looks yeah. off center another thing to think of too is even not just on hats so like i'm doing patches that's all i'm doing depending on different materials you use you might get uh, because of the weave, you just might not be able to do fine lettering. I can switch to my other camera again, but to you right now, this you can't read it, but it probably looks fine. But the closer you got, if I pull up my macro lens, you're going to see any straight line. It's like the capital E on the bottom. It's going to be all super jagged because of the way that I laid the fabric onto the hoop. The, the actual grid of the... Um, the twill, twill is technically the type, the name for the weave, the actual pattern. Instead of it being like this with the lettering, it's like this. So it, it, it steps so that needle penetration keeps landing in an alternate one. So no matter what I would do with my density or my everything, I mean, if I increase my density a lot, it would look super weird, but it would fix it. But it would basically it'll always be stepped and I can switch to the other lens to show you guys, if you guys want that. Um, yeah. So you're basically getting that zipper effect where, you know, you have your, your stitches on top of your fabric and it's and your stitches are falling in between the, the weave of that, the weave of that fabric. So it does have that, that jagged zipper effect look to it. Yeah. So this might actually be too close because it looks fine. <laughs> I I can see what you're saying, yeah. But yeah, there's 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 so many different factors, and and especially, you know, like like Matt's saying, he's running twill. So if if he's not worried about you know a left chest placement and trying to make it look straight and even in in in, in its correct placement on a on a particular shirt, you know that's kind of kind of dictate where you put it on a shirt because you're not going to worry about the angle of the weave and try to follow that. And then the logo ends up being, you know, at a 15 degree angle on your left chest and it's not straight. Matt's dealing with a piece of material that you can grab and you think to yourself, oh, it doesn't matter what angle I'm hooping this at. I'm going to just cut the, the patch out later. It can't. Um, if you are doing straight text on, on that twill and you're not going to, you know, base it with any type of fill or anything like that, um, it can affect the the way the stitches react to the to the fabric. So, I had one more thing. I was trying to find the design that I use this in because it's kind of a little cheat that I found. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about yet is tie-ins and tie-offs, and how that can drastically affect how your your small text looks. Because um, right when you tie in, you have to do a couple you know, back and forth or make a, a circle or it's got to like physically tie it in. If it's a small letter, like an S, if you're not watching where that tie in actually is, if it's in like the middle point or the, like in the center of it, that's going to close that S up and then it's going to turn into like a six or a, a weird nine or something like that, depending on where that is. Um, so you need to be careful where your tie in actually is, or you just don't tie it in, but then your thread can pull out. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, but there is an, an additional benefit to that or how you can turn that in. I 
like I said, I was trying to find a design. I used it within the past two weeks. <laughs> um, but basically, I had an issue where I had the tie-in, no matter what. But no matter where I put it, it just made the design look weird. So what I actually did is just say it wasn't S. I just removed like a couple of the stitches from the actual S itself so that that way when it tied in there it made it look like those stitches were there it so became kind of, a part of that part of the actual yeah. top stitches because yeah what, what matt's i think he's describing is a lot of times you get these weird bulges yeah in lettering uh depending on where you tie it in how the tie stitches are and tie offs um the tie the tie offs i think are a little bit more apparent uh just because you know after it finishes the satin it's, it has to lock in before it trims um, like in, in Wilcom, you can actually go into the tie off set and settings and it shows different methods you can do where this one kind of does, uh, kind of a diamond shape. So it kind of does in a diamond pattern. Um, this one is just kind of keeping in the straight line. This is the one I use the most when it comes to small lettering. So as it finishes the satin, it just kind of comes back over that last stitch, a couple of small stitches to lock in, uh, something like this with the diamond where it's going to kind of come back in come down and it's and it's kind of doing a lot more surface of that small lettering it's going to kind of make a little bulge at the end of that satin so it can yeah, look weird dimple. yeah and another thing too so um i'm going to bring mine up really quick um so this is the, the exact patch that you guys saw uh, ignore the little graphics glitch here it's a stupid resolution issue um but basically you see how i have a connector going between the e and the t that's not on my patch at all. You can't see with the lighting, but because I didn't want that bulgy tie off and then another tie in plus and that's another trim for my machine. And when you're doing hundred patches, that's two hours worth of just tie ins in the text alone. Um, so it's much easier to just leave for me to leave the connecting line, tell it not to trim inside the text and then I know uh, Cindy has one of these little, uh, they're called squeezers. Um, they're like scissors and uh, tweezers together. But basically, if I zoom in, you have to be, I've learned this from the hard way, uh, you want to make sure that your connector is running as close to perpendicular as the stitch underneath it because then basically all I have to do is just slide it up underneath that connector line and cut it. And if it's close enough, you can just cut it once. You don't have to connect or cut both sides. You just hit it with a little heat gun and it just shrinks it down. And then it actually seals it, um, kind of cauterizes the, the thread and then it won't come undone. And it's kind of like you tied it off and a tie in. Um, but if this fill, let's say, I can remember where that is. If that was a zero, well, now I have to sit there and dig through all 50 patches to make sure I don't cut that fill. So that's a trade-off. Make sure you check that. <laughs> don't ask me how I learned that. Yeah, and, and when it comes to small lettering in particular, you you that's when you can usually get away with not having to trim between letters. And you shouldn't trim between letters unless you really need to, right? So... Yeah. Because that's where you get all your false thread breaks is mm -hmm. usually in lettering in between torrent and in between trims and stuff. So um, it's just something to keep in mind because usually if it's a millimeter or less in between letters, that's totally fine and it looks okay because that's not enough area to really be noticeable. Right. And if you are working with that really small, small lettering, like in this previous patches, if, if the space between your words are even like the, the T to the W, um, especially if you don't have really, really high tra contrasting colors, say like it was a, a gray underneath those, those white stitches, you can sometimes bury a stitch in between those two words and it'll kind of just drop that stitch into the back fill. And then there's no trim at all, whether it's manual or on the machine. Um, so that's another trick where you can kind of hide the jump stitches by burying it into the background. Um, and this is where, you know, being aware of your fill direction is is definitely being aware of that. 
um, and utilizing the fact that your fill is at the same angle as, as your as your stitch that's going over it. If you drop a needle penetration in there, it's going to fall right into that fill. So, you know, it may just kind of to the eye kind of look like that really mini jump between the two, like the W and the A and the A and the T. There's that small little line you see there, but it's not, looks, it doesn't look connected at the end. Yeah, and you, you got to remember too, like, we only notice it because we're doing the work. Customer won't. Like, I've clipped all the ones in the, um, that had black underneath it. I clipped those, but the Swift Water Rescue, um, I didn't clip that. And then on the bottom, it said the black sheep. I only, well, I guess I did clip clip them, but yeah. So I think I did one, two, uh, three, four. I clipped four strings on here, just four snips, not eight, just four. And then hit it with the heat gun. It was gone. So yeah, little tricks can uh, save time in production and I think give you a little bit better look as far as um, quality. So, no. We check all the boxes there, Matt. We did. We even got the one that says Mike right there. Answered <laughs> Mike's question. Mike, you should, you should feel special up there up north, Mike. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's we could probably talk for hours on, on different factors. And, you know, there are times where, you know, I think all of us have been doing it long enough, you know, especially when it's Matt, when he's digitizing for himself, for his machines, for his patches, he knows his settings, his tricks, all the stuff that works best for him. Um, but, you know, like for me and DJ, where we're digitizing for, you know, either fonts that he's creating or I'm digitizing for other people, um, there's there's kind of those set ways that we get into that we've learned, have you have worked over the years and 95% of the time it will work. But then there's those those few factors that may come back and say, hey, you know, this lettering is not working too good or this, you know, or that factor of this is landing right in the center of a, of a Richardson 112 and I'm breaking needles every single time or, you know, try to avoid tie offs right in the middle, um, tie ins or tie offs right in the middle of a seam of a hat. Um, just those slight little adjustments that you do, especially on lettering, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you cleaner results and, and better production time and less downtime as far as production. I got one more bonus tip. What's that? Um, so we talked about maybe just digitizing the text for your, your small text. Just do it manually. Maybe not, just don't even look at the stock fonts. Just digitize manually. If you find yourself doing the exact same font a lot in about the same size every single time because there's not a stock font for that. Why not just make a stock font for that? So you can save a lot of time. Like all of my patches, okay, not all. Most of them, I use the same font on all of them because my clients don't care what the font looks like. So I use one that looks like that. It's all the same but there's not a stock Wilcom font or pulse font for it. So I just got with Jeff and like, Hey, this is, these are all the letters. And he just made me a font with all of that. And it's at the exact uh, size. So I don't have to worry at all about, you know, uh, A's becoming taller, Z's becoming shorter, stuff like that. It's all already preset. It's a five and a half millimeter font perfectly executed every single time. Yeah. Well, so yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of getting into a whole other realm of things. Is you 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 find a you know there are fonts online that typically for most of the major softwares out there that you can go out and purchase that are separate from the stock fonts that come with your systems. Um, but what Matt's referring to is um, Jeff does have the add-on, the font creator add-on to Wilcom. So he can actually create fonts. That's what I know. DJ does a lot of uh, work with in. Um, mm -hmm. Floriani. Uh, I'm working on a really cool one right now. And it's um, the smallest satin lettering that I think I've ever seen. Wow. And the trick is everything, every stitch is horizontal. There is no vertical stitches. I have used that technique before when, when the lettering is 
is mandatory and it's at that size that typical run-of-the-mill lettering is not going to work i have i have used that technique it's yeah you can get those lowercase letters that are way under a quarter of an inch and it's pretty amazing it's it's actually it's pretty cool but um so everything is manually punched one stitch at a time so wow. there is no using a column stitch or anything like that it's you're everywhere you click that is that is the ultimate control of, of dj knowing where every stitch is going to go you're not relying on the on the computer to say okay this is a satin stitch filling this area in this stitch count or this density and it's going to kind of decide how it does it and and how to lay down the stitches you're actually you're punching every single stitch where it needs to go so that's ultimate control um but yeah the, you you do have to find a digitizer that has the software that's able to to create a font like that and that has the same font software that you have so it is something where specialty file types where you can actually install a font um, one last thing before we go you know a lot of things are called fonts um, even I have fonts on my site uh, some 3d puff fonts that I've done Yes, it is. It is a font of every letter in the alphabet, digitized manually, but it's not. It's it's not an installable font. It's saved in many generic software formats, uh, so any software can open them. But you do have to open each individual letter. You know, you can put them together if you have the software to do so. Um, but that's that's kind of a different what's called a font when you're kind of open each individual letters and using them next to something where you can actually keyboard from your software and type something out. So yeah, that's one of the fonts there. Thank Pretty you, cool. Matt. <laughs> Game with plug. All right. Um, unless there's any other questions or anything else you guys want to add, I think uh, it's about that time. I got nothing. I think it was a good live. I think there's a lot of tips and tricks and knowledge, and I'm glad to be back fidgeting with my 3D Puff Pro and my Puff Pro Pocket. <laughs> um, if you want to throw up that link there, uh, Matt, for our, all our links, um, if you do have any questions or if you're seeing, if you are watching this later on in the replay, uh, go ahead and, and drop a line in the comments if you do have any questions and. I know one of us will will see it and try to answer the best you can. If not, I know a lot of people in the nerd community will will answer the question too if they see the questions. But there's a link to to find all of us. Uh, that's DJ. That's Matt from Patch Phrase. DJ Anderson from Digitizing Match Class. I'm Justin Armenter from JA Digitizing, and all of us are here for the Needle Bar Live representing the uh, the Embroidery Nerd Group. So thanks for coming out, and we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Good night. Yeah.